So welcome everybody and my special thanks to Dr. Victor, Dr. Pascal and men who are here for this very interested, uh, interesting topic about uh, robotics in neuro intervention. So I'll introduce uh, Dr. Victor, he's a neurosurgeon and he was trained in Brazil. Then he worked with Professor Jack Moray and Pierre Las Junias in Paris and then he was in Geneva in the University Hospital of Geneva as the head of interventional neuroradiology and now he's part of Toronto Neurovascular Group. Of course, I think all of us know about him. He's one of the pioneers uh, in this field. Has involved in a lot of trials of stroke thrombectomy, including SIRF Prime, SIRF Direct, Dawn Trial, Promise Study, Prima Trial. And of course, he has done a lot of other research work, including I heard very nice lectures from him about computational fluid, fluid dynamics and others. And he has a lot of publications in that regard. And of course, he was the first person to do the uh, intracranial robotic neuro intervention. So all of us are very excited to have him here. And uh, our and uh, uh, Dr. Pascal is also here with us. He's a professor of neurological surgery and head of neurovascular and endovascular neuro surgery at the department in the Thomas Jefferson, uh, Jefferson uh, University. He's a dual trained vascular neurosurgeon, does interventional as well as open, has a lot of publication. I've read a lot of papers from him. 400 papers, uh, including stroke, neurosurgery, JNS, interventional neurology, general neurosurgery, many chapters, as well as three books, and has rever and also received a national award for a new technique of treatment of retinoblastoma, and he's expert in wines. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so welcome all of you, and I think uh, without much ado, we'll get started. So Dr. Vero, uh, Vitor Pereira will be taking the first talk about these, what his experience about this uh, robotics in uh, neuro intervention. Yeah, can you guys, uh, yeah, I will just- You have to go to screen share now, yes. Yeah. Dr. Vitor Pereira has started screen share. So thank you very much, Vipu and Raj for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here also sharing the session with Pascal. Uh -huh. We've been uh, talking and working with robotics and it's also very good to welcome you here. Good morning, good afternoon, or good night, good evening to some, some of you. So we will talk about uh, our experience with robotic assisted uh, neurovascular intervention. So these are my disclosures r related to this talk. Uh, and if we think about robotics in medicine, I know that uh, at least in our field last year, we've been talking more about it, but it's not something new. The first robotic procedure was uh, done in 1983 for an orthopedic procedure here in Vancouver, uh, Canada. And then following that, we saw a lot of different robots for uh, stroke and spine, uh, spine procedures. And the Da Vinci was the big uh, robotic boom. Today, more than 50,000 physicians are trained in performing abdominal and different surgeries with the Da Vinci. On intervention, robotic is uh, started with uh, just angiograms, machines, robots to do angiograms. But lately, on intervention itself, we had uh, a few companies developing a system to perform a robotic assisted endovascular surgery. And uh, as if we can speak about history, although few cases have been done uh, almost 10 years ago, we have the systems cleared and up and running and going and approved to do endovascular surgery as recent as 2012 for PCI, uh, 2018, at least at the North American and FDA level for uh, peripheral vascular intervention, and uh, we have uh, the neuro interventions approved in Europe and Australia. And as we've been performing using special access, and we will join a trial uh, and as well as Pascal Center and Rose uh, performing carotid intervention in North America. So if we think about endovascular robotics, we have two systems, the navigation system, there are systems that can only perform navigation of catheters. One example is the Magellan robotic system. And when we speak about robotic interventions, we have different companies. And the company that is, has, is more advanced is the company Corindus now, a Siemens Health Near company. You have other systems, but they are not at the level of Corindus. And 
what is the robotic system? You know, the robotic system is uh, you have different uh, pieces. You have, first of all, a robotic arm that is, uh, stays bedside, is attached to the table. And you have uh, the operator console where we operate the, ro the robotic arm. This uh, console can be inside or outside the room. And then uh, you have a monitor and you have all the joysticks to operate the robotic arm. We will see how this all works. And you can do peripheral interventions and neural interventions with the system that we just, uh, we will show you uh, here. It's called a core path GRX. The system has two versions, one version for PCI peripheral that can manipulate stents, balloons, perform interventions, perform carotid stents, and the neural version that can manipulate micro catheters, micro wires, neural devices, and has an increased travel distance to reach more far distal than the other uh, system. And has also a different movement controls that we will learn a little bit about it uh, uh, in, a, in a couple of seconds. So this is the, the close view of the robotic uh, arm. So here you have the fixed part, so which is uh, uh, the robotic arm per se. This plastic uh, is structure that you can see here, this is called cassette. This is every procedure you have to use a new one. This is a sterile uh, cassette to use. And then you have a small monitor. It is a touch screen that you cover with a sheet and then you can operate and communicate with the operator console. And you have different lines. Uh, you have lines that are compatible for, uh, with uh, micro wires. You have a, a Y connector holder that is placed in front. You have the wires that are here. And in this wire, you have this path that actually is able to rotate. So you can rotate the wire. So this is why the wire goes through one uh, part of the cassette and the devices go to a different one. This is just a linear grab that has more grab to push and pull the different devices. This is the robotic cassette. So you have you load the micro catheter with the Y connector into the cassette and then you can uh, during different steps of the procedure load the wires and devices. And this is the operator console uh, that we will have a closer view. Usually we place the robotic arm in the bedside. This is the position that we, we have here. So in Toronto, the robotic arm is just on the bedside below on, on the inferior portion of the table. And we have here one physician or one technologist that uh, is helping the robotic specialist that will actually manipulate the robotic arm. And here, we, we have two options. We have the primary operator inside the room and outside the room. So we are already preparing for remote procedures. So we've been testing different communication tools. So we have uh, an option to do uh, the procedure completely remote uh, without being seen and communicating directly uh, with eyesight with the bedside team. So this is, this is, uh, how we prepare the console. So this is a video of our robotic technologist, Nicole Cancellari, that uh, she's here putting the, the robotic cassette. So as you can see, there's a plastic and uh, she's preparing here the robotic cassette uh, and it's placing uh, uh, into the robotic arm and the robotic cassette is completely sterile uh, and every cassette is comp completely adapted and uh, we have to do a couple of tests and this is how we place the micro catheter. Once we navigate, so the, the procedure starts with the navigation of the distal access catheters, all the access system that you have. From that point, you will then connect the micro catheters to the robotic arm. This version doesn't, doesn't do the navigation of the access systems. It will only navigate the micro catheters and manipulate the micro wires and device. But in a procedure, all the intracranial portion can be performed completely robotically. And here you see that once you connect the micro catheter, you have a, 
a sheaf that actually you you navigate protecting the microcatheter. So when the robotic system will navigate the microcatheter, this microcatheter will not uh, kink or herniate outside uh, uh, the the Y connector, the RHV connector from the guiding catheter. So we have, this is the preparation. So once the microcatheter is connected, the microcatheter is placed inside this tube. This tube is connected to the robotic arm and every manipulation of the robotic arm will have the microcatheter inside this tubing to prevent herniation during the, the procedure. So these are different steps of the preparation. Once we have everything that is connected, uh, here you have the connectors that uh, uh, keep this tubing and the microcatheter attached to the guiding catheter that you place manually. And then we are ready to go and uh, continue the procedure from the uh, operator console. So this is the, the, the configuration that we started doing. So this is the view from the operator uh, console. So I'm here performing one of the procedures. The team is here on the bedside. And because the console is shielded, you don't need actually to, uh, to, to wear lead. So you, I, I perform the procedures just behind the shield. It's a very comfortable console and you are sitting and you have the screens in front of you, you can have fully control of the procedure. And this is the view of the console. You have uh, actually a touch screen and you have three joysticks, one to control the micro catheter, one to control the micro wire and another one to control the devices. And you saw that they, are diff they have different lines and inside this touch screen, you have also different functions that are already preset that you can use during the procedure to help you performing different uh, uh, tasks. So you have uh, different, uh, you can have a prefixed rotate. So the, the, the system will rotate 90 degrees. You have millimetric controls. As you can see here, you have, you can move the catheters by moving the joystick or you can use the buttons to manipulate and move it every milli millimeter. You have limited speed, so you can limit the speed of your joystick, you can accelerate, you can fix the wire and advance the microcatheter. So all these functions are predetermined and you can just take advantage of them and use during the procedure. Here's an example of one of these functions. I'm here uh, before we, 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 I show this video, just want to make, uh, bring your attention to the position of the distal access catheter. So this is all the distal access catheters placed manually. And the position of the distal access catheter has to be calculated based on the length of the micro catheter that you will have to navigate. This robotic system can navigate up to 20 centimeters. So you know that uh, the further distal you want to be, this is, ha has to be at least 20 centimeters from the tip of your guiding catheter. So this is, you see here, this is uh, one of uh, six French guiding cat, uh, distal access catheters that we use. And here we have a micro catheter. We, place, we did the coiling already of this aneurysm. And now we will place a stent. And you see here, I have a micro catheter and a micro wire. My wire was going inside the aneurysm. I didn't want, and I use this function, it's called rotate and retract. So the, the machine, the robot rotate, and then I was able then to advance. And this is a very precise uh, rotation. So sometimes you see that we struggle a little bit rotating. The robot system grabs it and rotates so fast and it makes the rotation very controllable, as you can see here. So this is a very, very good function that we have and it facilitates a lot the navigation of uh, the micro wires and, and uh, the micro catheters. This is another function. This is a very interesting one. This is called active device fixation. Actually, it fixes the wire and allows you to navigate the microcatheter in a very efficient way. 
So, and it controls this lack of the system. So you see here, you saw that I navigated my micro wire until the MCA. And now I'm not holding my micro wire. The computer is doing it. The robot is doing it. And I just it pin the micro wire and I advanced my micro catheter. And this is a function that permits you to go inside stents. It permits you to recapture stents. This is a very good function that you can use not only to, to navigate the microcatheters over the wires. So Tubo, so once to expedite the speed of the procedures, you can control the speed of the movements. And so, and the Turbo is just a button that you press and then you can and make an exchange way faster and so you gain time during the procedure. So let's take a look here in, a, in, in a, our second robotic case. I will show you the use of these tools during a procedure. So this is the procedure that we started preparing. You saw the preparation earlier in the video. Uh, this, uh, we, we have here the distoxus catheter in V3. And now I'm navigating the micro wire. So you see here, I'm moving the microwire joystick. I'm using active device fixation. So I'm pinning the, the wire and I'm advancing the micro catheter. So this is to pass the curve. So that was our second case. We were still very, very careful today. We navigate the system way, way faster and with uh, way more uh, uh, assurance. So my, the tip of my micro catheter is here in front of the aneurysm. My plan for this case was to place an atlas stent uh, over the neck and then go inside the aneurysm and then uh, uh, coil. And you see this is not a straightforward aneurysm. We, we have chosen the cases for robotics, cases that the patient will benefit of the precision of the robotic system on the stent placement. And uh, also we, we consider that it were feasible on a robotic way from catheter placement and also uh, navigation and, and also anatomic structure. So here I'm using device fixation again. I fixed the wire and now I advanced my micro catheter into P1. So you see from the guiding catheter, all the steps of navigation are done similar to what we would do manually. However, you have all these prefixed uh, or pre-established functions that can help you a lot and can increase the control of the manipulation of your devices. So now I'm removing my, my micro wire. We will then uh, place the stent. Uh, we have tested a number of stents uh, in these procedures. So this is the exchange. So we remove the uh, micro wires. One detail is that we need to use uh, the exchange length uh, micro wires because of the, 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 the length of, of the, 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 the robotic uh, console. And we cannot use short wires at all. So this is uh, one detail on the robotic procedure. So now we are loading here. This is Dr. Bhatia, Kartik Bhatia from Australia. He finished his fellowship with us. He's loading here the Atlas tent inside the RHV. And yeah, once the the stent is loaded in the robotic uh, arm. You remember that we had a, the main one in the middle is for the, the wire and on the side is from the devices. So we loaded, so the bedside team loads the device inside the, the cassette. And then once they have done, for the sake of time, I'm just going ahead. Then I start, I take over. And I like to deploy stents with the millimetric control. So you push the stent one millimeter and you pull one millimeter of the micro catheter or you do two millimeters with the stent and one millimeter with the catheter. This uh, technique you can use, there are different ways to deploy stents, but this makes us be able to precisely place the stent with um, inframillimetric precision. So this is probably one of the features of the robotic system today 
that is uh, the most. Uh, I mean, th this is the feature that I like the most, and this is already here a feature that if you, if a colleague doesn't have enough experience, the robotic will be way better than 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 a manual procedure, particularly on the placement of the device. And here we are placing the stent. So you see here the digital markers of the stent being placed. This is the marker of the the microcatheter. So I'm here slowly because I don't want to move, but you can actually deploy the stent uh, in a faster way. But again, I want to, to place my device more precise and I'm using a millimetric control. And again, you can use the joysticks to make the same function that I'm doing there. But I prefer to see, and uh, this is a, a, a good step of the procedure, and uh, during this procedure I was also taking pictures, so this is why, where you will see that the screens are, are blinking. So this is the deployment of the Atlas stent. As you can see, very precise placement. The stent is close to the final deployment. And you see that you have full control of the procedure. And it doesn't mean that the robotic system will do something for you. It's a, you, you are the master of the system. So you need to know the behavior of the device. You need to know how to perform the procedure, to perform it uh, robotically. And one of the functions, the device fixation, I'm turning it on. And now I will, it, the, it's a very good function to go inside the stand with your microcatheter. So as you, you will see, it controls, it centers the wire automatically and uh, it will, uh, it will uh, make you, your microcatheter go inside the aneurysm without being caught by the, the cells, the stent struts. So now I'm go my microcatheter is going up. Uh, and I will show you how then we took a microcatheter and we entered in. This is the wire of the stent. Although some may think they can go inside, I, I, I don't like. I like to take a micro wire and actually just moving forward to. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm here with the micro wire going inside. Then another function again, active device fixation. And now I'm going and using the millimetric control to go inside and go through the stent struts inside the aneurysm. So you will see that uh, the catheter is, is uh, holding a little bit uh, it's being held a little bit by this this stent struts and we you can control well I'm pulling the wire now to make the microcatheter a little bit more straight yeah so now I'm advancing my microcatheter and I'm pulling my, my wire and in, I'm inside the aneurysm. So once we were there, so remove the micro wire, place the coil on the, on the device. So this is the coil placement. I like to start placing the coil with the joystick and at the end I use the millimetric function again. So the first loops you can see and you can go very slow. And when you are sure that you have the first loop already there, then you can use the joystick again. So you, you don't have haptic, hap, haptic feedback. So you don't feel anything on the joysticks. But for you, for, for the colleagues that are used to have a visual control, this is uh, what uh, 
you know you you have to use so if you are used to proctor if you are used to train fellows uh, you we have a full visual control and from the console this visual control is enhanced because you are comfortable you have the screens just in front of you and uh, up to now from all the experiments and cases that we've done uh, we we had full control at least on aneurysm treatment of, of these procedures and we didn't need to feel or in any point that I had to go from the console to have a feeling of, of the device. This is the placement of the first coil. And as you can see here, you can push, pull, you have full, as manual, you have, you can do the same maneuvers, the same uh, speeds. However, here you can be sometimes more precise. So I'm just moving a little bit forward. So this is the end of the coil. So I'm using the joystick to place the coil. And at the end, you can switch to the millimetric control to place uh, the distal end of the coil uh, with a way, way better control or you can use the joystick. So I like to use the millimetric controls to place the final end of the coil. Uh, I will just move to the end. So this is a... Uh, we, we placed a number of coils, then you see that our microcatheter moved and during the procedure we had to, to reposition. We were coiling too much at the end and we decided to change and to move a little bit to the inferior portion of the aneurysm too. You can do that all. Uh, again, the robotic procedure gives us the a better control you will see here that we used all these pre uh, fixed uh, pre-established functions the rotate and retract you see there and it changes the position of the tip of the catheter and place and help us placing the the device inside the aneurysm so i love this function honestly it helps us a lot and and it's impressive you see how the robotic system can control uh, the, the devices. So the final end is this. So then we move the coil, the microcatheter there, and we could place a couple more coils. And I will show you the end result uh, in, in a couple of slides. So we have all these different functions that I just described to you, rotate and retract, millimetric control, limited speed, active device fixation that help us during the procedure. And you need to know the procedure and you need to know these functions to have a better use of the robotic system. So for us to get to that point, we did a number of experiments to know which systems and which devices we had to use. Uh, we did the pre-procedure rehearsal. So before doing that procedure, I had done the same case on a model before, so this is a little bit of the setups. Uh, and uh, before knowing where we had to place the catheters and which catheters were uh, used, uh, we tested uh, different devices in a number of models. So this is a little bit of our preclinical phase. So we tested uh, catheters and distal access catheters to know where we should place it systematically. And then we placed the different implants and we have chosen which devices we would uh, use in our first case. So in a total, we did 235 experiments. And uh, from these experiments, what was very important was the, the access. We discovered that for anterior circulation and posterior circulation, you had to use different sheaths. And the short and the too long uh, distal access catheters, you cannot use in robotic procedures. So, uh, this is uh, the text from a paper that uh, we just submitted. And uh, actually for robotic procedures, you will have a range and uh, a predetermined access that you will be able to use. So that was our first phase. Then on the second phase, we started do, uh, with knowing how distant we had to be uh, to develop knowing all these functions and also knowing which microcatheters and which devices we would uh, be able to, to perform better the procedures. And then once we had these, uh, the devices that we liked, 
we, we, we had chosen the patients that might benefit from a robotic precision and we, we made patient specific models and then we tested the procedures before and then we, we assess if we could do the procedure completely robotically. So this is, these are images of our first case. This is uh, a, a sidewall basilar, a large aneurysm that was growing. Uh, and this, these are images of the patient-specific model that we, we made. And we wanted uh, this, in this case, that the stent would be precisely placed below the basilar bifurcation and then that we would be able to go inside the aneurysm. So we had chosen the, all the material and we did two cases, two rehearsals to see and to also know which functions we, we had to use. So this was also part of our procedure. This is the model and this is the case. So, and interestingly, the same challenge that we faced on the model we had, we faced on, on the aneurysm, particularly in this case, on going inside the aneurysm, and we were very confident doing the case when we had the experience of the model before. So uh, we, we knew how to operate and we, we were confident with the operating console. I'm just saying that, that uh, as you could see, there's a lot of small details. They are not rocket science, but you have to know the system before and you have to know the procedure before to be a, a successful uh, robotic procedure. Uh, intervention. So this is the case that you saw, and this is the model that we deployed. Uh, again, the model and the case, the case that you just saw that we were performing. So we also did a rehearsal, complete rehearsal on, on the case. And this is the, we started then testing and assessing other devices. And when we had a number of uh, stent assisted coiling, we decided to uh, assess other devices. And one of the first devices that we, that are, uh, that we wanted to assess for a, for was a flow diverter. This is a, we were testing a Silk Vista baby in an M2. This is not a typical location that I would place a, a stent, at least here in Canada. But we, 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 we tested the placement of a Silk Vista baby uh, in, in, uh, in the model and we realized that this system is compl completely compatible with the robotic system. We could recapture, place, remove, replace, change position. We had full control as we have with manual with the advantage of being precise. And uh, on that perspective, we decided also that we would include in our clinical cases uh, a couple of uh, flow diverter devices. So. Uh, we moved the clinical case. We know we knew that we would be able to do stent-assisted coiling and flow diverter cases with uh, uh, the devices that we have tested. We have tested Sig Vista Baby and Evolve, and uh, we submitted to Ethics and to Health Canada, and we got approval to perform robotic procedures. Uh, and we have chosen wide neck aneurysms that would benefit of a stent. And it will also be challenging to place the stent in a precise position. And uh, our primary outcome was to be able to perform the procedure completely robotically without manual conversion. All the intercranial steps done completely robotically. And we also recorded procedural complications and all the technical issues that we may face. And in this first series, we enrolled six cases, two flow diverters and four stent assisted coiling. And uh, this is the first case. This is the first case of the team. And these are images of our setup here in Toronto. This is one of the configurations. The console is here in the corner and we have the console outside the, the room too. This is the, the, the other view. And these are images from the, this first case. Timo, my colleague here that was on uh, leading the bedside team, uh, Patrick Nicholson, um, uh, our colleague also uh, supporting the case. And here are images from the console just to show you the configuration on how we performed the, the first cases. And then we were uh, improving and you saw the different views of the console. That was just to show you 
a little bit the environment and where we were located compared to the bedside team. These are images from the first case. You saw the model, and here are the actual images from the case. We placed 14 coils in an Atlas tent. And this is a summary of the six patients, uh, uh, basilar, basilar tip, uh, right PCA, right ICA basilar and paraclinoid. Uh, the procedures didn't take uh, more time than regular procedures, despite of us as a team learning uh, these are procedures, these are times from the puncture, so aneurysm is being performed in an hour, so two hours when we had a, a lot of coils and uh, navigation challenge, but not more than a regular procedure. So we didn't have an increase in fluoroscopy time, that's a concern that was raised for a, a number of colleagues, but we didn't have any, any, any increase in fluoroscopy time and on the opposite side, you are actually, uh, the operator has no radiation and we, have, we are more conscious of the radiation uh, when we are doing robotic procedures. And uh, this is the MRS, and we had no, no complications and we performed stent assisted coiling and flow diverter procedures. We used four neuroform atlas, one silk vista baby and one surpass. We had no thromboembolic cases, and we had to change the cassettes, that uh, movable part of the robotic arm, in two procedures, uh, uh, particularly with because of an arrow on the movement of the, the, the wire. We didn't do any manual conversion, no robotic system failure. We didn't have any communication issues in every time we were able to, to manipulate the robotic system and the devices after placement. So this is uh, one of the uh, flow diverter cases, a 64 year old patient that uh, had a ruptured uh, uh, PCOM in an occluded ICA. So it's a little bit a tricky anatomy. This is the vert basilar. This is the PCOM that's actually feeding the MCA because the carotid is occluded. And the aneurysm was in the PCOM. In the ruptured phase, we placed coils, we protected the aneurysm, and now we came to put more coils and place uh, the flow diverter. We did it uh, radio, uh, although I'm not like Pascal, a radio first uh, man, but I, I, we do use a radio approach here as a, our alternative approach. Uh, and this is, uh, these are images of the deployment of the Silk Vista baby inside the PCOM through the basilar. So here's my distal axis catheter. I have here a headway, and uh, you will see here different steps. Uh, I have already coiled the aneurysm. I'm here just showing you the, the placement of the Silk Vista. And this is the final Silk Vista deployment over the neck. And this is the, the follow-up. And as you can see here, the stent is well opposed and well open, and the procedure completely done uh, robotically. This is another case, uh, a patient with a paraclinoid aneurysm. And we placed uh, another flow diverter, an Evolve stent. And uh, from this, it's it's very interesting. This is, I, I, I I advanced a little bit, but just for you to see how we use the, this was our fifth procedure, active device fixation and how we can use all these functions to deploy precisely uh, a flow divert. This is a Surpass Evolve, which is a 64 wire evolution of the Surpass. So a stent that we can manipulate a lot and it's very easy to resheave. And we felt that was very appropriate to place and here in this case, we have the PCOM that I didn't want to cover with the Surpass Evolve. This is why you see that I'm reshifting a little bit, doing completely uh, remote. And uh, once I had my device placed where I, I wanted, I actually uh, uh, finished the procedure and finished the deployment. And as you can see here, we placed proximal to the PCOM and uh, the device well opposed and covering perfectly the neck as we always do and check with the convincities. 
So this is the, a series of, of cases. So up to now, in this series, six cases. Uh, now we will start enrolling in a mood center study that is being promoted by Corindus and Siemens uh, that will enroll uh, uh, more than 100 patients in different centers worldwide. And we are now preparing our series to, to be adding cases more to the, to the, to the study. And from everything we, we've learned in this journey of robotics up to now is that uh, you, 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 the robot will not do anything for you. You will, you will do. So you need to know the procedure before you do it robotically. And uh, it's very important to know all the steps and, uh, and the training on the robot. You have to train also on doing procedures with a visual sense rather than the haptic sense. So for the colleagues that are used to train and proctor, this is easy. It's a very uh, straightforward step. For the colleagues that are used to feel, then they need a step further to, to go and to be ready to perform robotics. You have to be aware of the device compatibilities. We are doing a long, uh, long study testing different devices from different companies. So we hopefully will have that published soon. And uh, we are also working, you have to know the travel distance. So you have to prepare your vascular access before robotic. And the procedure planning is very important. This is uh, one of the training sessions that we had on deploying the Evo stand. So we, 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 we had the, the chance of being uh, in one of the first. So we had a lot of devices, a lot of, of uh, uh, models to, to train and to practice. So when we knew which devices we were able, would be able to successfully perform robotically, and now for you guys, you will have this all published so you will know the system that we use that will better and then you can always uh, use that information to have a successful uh, initial practice uh, as, as, as we had. And uh, this is uh, uh, one of the experiments. I had my kids with me. My wife uh, was uh, shopping for before Christmas. And uh, I had my kids here. Backward, backward, faster, backward, faster. Okay, now forward faster. Now forward slow. Very slow. Yeah. So this now is backward faster. Now backward slow. Yeah. Very good. This is my six six year boy manipulating the wire and the device uh, joysticks. Uh, as as I said, the training is is straightforward. The system is uh, my my son saw me doing my my kids, my three year old also manipulated it. And uh, if you know that, I mean, the device is very user friendly. You need to know also those functions that can help you during the procedure. And I think with all that, this is a procedure that is set set to success. So. Uh, also, the bedside team training is important. You need someone that knows the robotic arm very well and a bedside operator that knows uh, how to secure the system when you are exchanging those devices. This is a very important uh, step. Uh, it also doesn't require, you don't need a one-year training, but you need uh, to be trained in certain steps. And then also the communication between the teams, they are also, it's, it's very important because I, I'm the main operator and I'm not on the bad side. For me, it was the main step that I had to be trained because I'm very, uh, con I control my procedures like 100%. I like to see my RHVs. I like to look for bubbles. So I had to develop a trust on my bedside team. And this is very important. And also how to communicate. I'm taking over the robotic control. I'm giving you change this, do that. So all the communication uh, had to be developed. And now that we are doing procedures completely remote, it's another uh, important step that we, we need to do uh, to have uh, for a successful procedure and work on the communication. And on that note, the remote has been done. India has been uh, a pioneer on that. Uh, these are different uh, remote procedures that were done with hardwire fiber and Wi-Fi and fiber. 
And uh, last year, uh, five PCI procedures were performed in India. Uh, and uh, this is the publication. And uh, they were successfully performed 20 miles away. This was a big step for us. And it prepared us for the future and for uh, what is uh, to come. And on our field, we know that the stroke is, is a sharp rise. We, we know how it has impacting our, our, our practices. And at least here in North America, we have an issue of access, treatment access. Here in Canada, we have uh, more than 50% of the people that are out far away from a, a center that can offer thrombectomy. And we have issues with transportation. We have the weather that doesn't help uh, uh, four to six months uh, a year. Uh, and then we, we have a, a, a true issue for uh, a, a procedure and a treatment that offers uh, a real benefit, a number needed to treat of two or three, as we know from the latest trials. And people ask me, can you perform with this current system uh, a robotic procedure? I didn't. Uh, the system is not set for stroke yet. Uh, they, uh, Siemens is developing with Corindus a new setup that will be dedicated for stroke. Uh, these are images from an experiment that we were able to place a balloon guiding catheter and we were able to place uh, a stent retriever. This is an embo trap. Uh, so since the placement of a stent retriever is similar to a stent, so we can really, this is something that uh, we can master with the robotic system. So this, these are steps of placement of the embo trap into a simulated, this is a model, uh, MCA uh, occlusion. So the detail here is that we have to remove the microcatheter sim similar to what we do on the, on the case. Uh, then we inflate the balloon guiding catheter and the robotic system can pull. This is the embo trap from back and performed. This is again a model, but this sets, uh, uh, you know, a precedent. The current system has to be just adapted for stroke to be able to perform more steps of the procedure, particularly if we are speaking about remote procedures in the future. But this is already today what we can do with the current system, at least in a simulated version. This is the balloon guiding catheter inflated. And here we can pull. I'm pulling slowly because uh, I want to assess everything. But you can pull with a turbo. You can do as fast as you can do manually too. So this is where we are with stroke. And I think uh, from everything that we, we, we came across, the clinical, we are there. Aneurysm treatment is a reality. More precision on state plans, placement, uh, wire manipulation, very safe. And we are going towards remote in the future, hopefully, as Siemens uh, and Corindus, they are working with a number of uh, different evolutions uh, platform navigation, association with artificial intelligence, remote capabilities, uh, and more functions to increase the safety of the procedure. I'm looking forward for this development, and I think we were very fortunate to have Corindus attached to uh, uh, an imaging company like Siemens, that they will certainly bring more uh, evolution for, for our field. I, I, I think... Uh, I shared with you my, my thoughts and I think uh, that is more to come and I'm looking forward for the next steps and for remote procedures. I have to thank my research team, Corindus and Siemens, uh, John Michael that is responsible for our site, Mark Tolan, John Van Vliet, uh, there have been a big support from Corindus to our, uh, to our team. My, my local team, my kids that have been patient uh, and coming here during all these procedures and uh, to my colleagues here at uh, Toronto West. And, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vitor. That was very, very interesting. I, I think everybody thoroughly enjoyed that talk.
I just Dr. want to apologize. Dr. Pereira has stopped screen share. All right. I just want to apologize for some strange comments coming in. It seems robot we have never seen that before in our you know meetings, and I think robot is evoking some strange reaction in people. But I'm sure. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody else did it as well. So what we will do is uh, there are a lot of questions already, but um, you know we will take them in the end uh, if that is fine. And uh, I think we can go to on our next lecture by Dr. Pascal Jabber, who will be talking about radial approach for cavity stenting and uh, what he sees is the future. Dr. Pascal Jabber has started screen share. All right. Uh, can you see? My... Yes, we can. Sure. Okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you again, uh, Vipul and Raj, for the invitation and outstanding lecture from uh, Vitor. As usual, you, uh, you are always a hard act to follow. Uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit uh, the robotics in the pandemic area, uh, era. Um, and uh, in the U.S. at this point, uh, the robotic uh, endovascular, the Corandus, is not uh, FDA approved for any intracranial. So you're not going to see any exciting cases of uh, aneurysms yet, uh, but we started with uh, by doing some um, carotid stents and some uh, transradial angiograms. Those are my disclosures. Uh, so uh, as we know, the likelihood of a good functional outcome decreases by 12% for every 30 minutes uh, in delay in re recanalization in acute stroke. Uh, and there is around a third of stroke patients get to a comprehensive stroke center really beyond uh, uh, 12 hours. So a lot of pre-hospital uh, delays, which is the primary reason uh, for that. And there are a lot of geographic disparities in stroke outcomes. If we look in the U.S., mainly in the stroke belt, uh, because there is a reduced uh, access to healthcare depending on uh, geographic uh, location. Uh, we know that under optimal conditions, a large proportion of the U.S. population will be unable to access a comprehensive stroke center within uh, 60 minutes. So what have we accomplished so far? Uh, so far, we've accomplished a lot of uh, uh, advancement in devices. Uh, we are able to open more vessels. Uh, we accomplished uh, a lot of advances in screening methods, timing, uh, streamlining the process, uh, creating stroke networks, telemedicine, mobile stroke unit, ICU prevention. So we've done a lot, of, a lot in those uh, areas. But one area that's uh, uncharted water still is uh, about to be explored, which is remote stroke interventions. So you're all, famous with, you're all familiar with those famous robots, but now there's a new robot in town. It looks a little bit like that. So it's, you don't have to, to reach for me. I will come to you. So we're practically hopefully be able to offer treatment for a patient that does not have to come to a hub hospital. So this is the Corendus robot. Uh, I know you're going to see a lot of things that Vitor showed, but quickly that's the console, that's the device that's going to be the arm, the robotic arm that's going to be uh, hooked to the table. And uh, this is what we were talking about. This is the first coronary stent uh, that was done in India 20 miles away. Uh, it was done here from a temple, and as you see here, uh, there were, uh, they were uh, a team next to the patient, and the operator was uh, manipulating the robot and was able to successfully deploy a coronary stent. This was uh, really a major advancement in, in endovascular uh, robotic. So uh, the remote physician unit is uh, in our uh, hospital. It's in the control room. It's outside the INR room. Uh, again, I'm going to go quickly on those because Vito showed them real nicely. You have uh, three joysticks, uh, one uh, for the guide catheter uh, that you can twist uh, and advance forward and backward. Another one uh, is for the uh, wire, micro wire. Another one is for the uh, device. Uh, that's the robotic arm. And those are all the ports. Uh, there's one port that's for a manual. So there's a, a port for a microcatheter, a port for the device, and then a port that's uh, mainly a manual port where you can put a micro wire and use it uh, manually. Uh, you can open all this and then load the catheters. Again, I'm going to go quickly on those. That's in, here in B, you see the manual port. And this is in A, the device port. And this is the micro wire that goes all the way all along that. 
Uh, it is user friendly because you have a screen where uh, next to the robotic arm and it will tell you at every step, it will tell you what's the next step and what you should do. And this is very important because those are very defined steps. So you will be able to read every, every step. Uh, this is one of the first paper by uh, Gavin Brits from Houston, where uh, they talked about the future of cerebrovascular surgery and the vascular robotics. He uh, also published the feasibility in an animal model. Uh, so uh, this is showing a little bit the prep. So this is the cassette that's disposable. You need to prep the arm, uh, lock the cassette, and uh, turn it in and hook it to the guide catheter. And there is a special uh, 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 TUI uh, here device that you're gonna uh, place it. And this is uh, that the device, like the tube that will go in and uh, prevent herniation of the uh, guide catheter and uh, the uh, micro catheter. So this was a transradial uh, procedure. And then here we're opening all the ports and that's the RHV, RHV that is used. That's the micro catheter going here and the micro wires. This is the uh, transradial carotid stent that we, this was the first case we did. So as you see here, advancing the device. That's what happen what's happening. So this was uh, the lesion. This is my partner, Dr. Juma Keres next to me and uh, this is the uh, stenosis we're bringing up the uh, protection device then uh, the balloon and then the stent uh, here's the final result and that's the team another carotid stent here so uh, this device i saw some questions earlier does not take a 035 or 038 so uh, this device uh, uh, takes only micro wires so far in this uh, version. So uh, you need to catheterize the vessels manually, the internal or, uh, or external. So as you see here, that's my micro wire. I'm, I'm using uh, the, the robot to cross uh, the lesion. Uh, and then I'm bringing up the protection device. That's the spider being deployed all robotically. Then I'm bringing up the balloon. The balloon is up and then somebody needs to inflate the balloon from inside the room. My team is inside the room and then the balloon is inflated. Then we can remove the balloon through with the robot and advance the, uh, the stent through the robot and that's the uh, final result. I'm on floor. So this is what's actually happening in the room. As you're manipulating outside, you're gonna see microcatheters coming in and out, and that's the stent after deployment being uh, pulled, the catheter of the, of the stent. So uh, as you see here, another uh, case. So, I do all my cases transradial. So this is the shaping of the Simmons catheter, then advancing uh, the shuttle sheath in the common. And uh, that's the lesion. Bringing up the uh, protection device robotically. So every single step that you would do manually and that's the stent. So, and this was the uh, paper we published. It was the feasibility and proof of principle uh, when we did our first cases. So it was 10 cases between uh, 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 carotid stents and uh, diagnostic angiograms. Uh, we just recently uh, have a paper that's going to come out soon where we did a comparison between uh, robotic assisted and uh, manual carotid stenting. 
And uh, again, um, like uh, Vitor said earlier, radiation exposure was non-statistically significant, contrast those non-statistically significant. Fluoroscopy time was not uh, different or statistically significant. The only thing is that the time of, of the procedure was a little bit more because we're still at the learning curve uh, of that. But this didn't, it's, it wasn't the fluoroscopy time or the radiation exposure, it's just the time between prepping the robot and uh, and things like that. So I think uh, uh, the, we train fellows and residents. This is very exciting for them because we are training the next generation of neurointerventionists on the robot. Uh, and then uh, until uh, this little creature invaded, invaded our, uh, our world and uh, we had acquired the robot a little bit before the pandemic. So uh, this changed everything, as you know, and we started uh, you know, doing crazy things uh, like... Uh, Jefferson Hospital's vascular division. Check out this TikTok of Dr. Pascal Jabour and his team. <laughs> no, I'm good, I'm good. So it was very important to keep uh, the morale high of the group. We are here for you. And we started seeing, you know, as I said, the, the weird things. Uh, people started buying all the toilet paper in the supermarkets. And this is a new reality. Like this is at our hospital where uh, there are buckets for used masks because used masks are being sterilized. This is something that we've never seen with, you know, the stocks crashing and with little things making us happy. Like this is, uh, can you guess what's in this bag? Well, in this bag is my uh, only uh, N95 mask that I'm going to have to use for a full week uh, because we don't have enough and it's going to be re-sterilized. So again, it's a little bit uh, a, a contrast. I'm showing you like the latest of the technology. I'm showing you an, endo, uh, an endovascular robot yet uh, I'm showing you here that uh, I have to use my N95 for uh, multiple times and we don't have enough uh, protection devices. So, And we started seeing more and more strokes. Uh, this is a, a, one of the first cases we've done of a multiple vessel occlusion on a COVID positive patient. This is the ACA, this is the MCA, both occluded. That's the CT chest. We are all using those, uh, those papers. And then uh, we collaborated with multiple centers and... Uh, uh, we looked at uh, 50 patients COVID positive that, uh, that had uh, stroke presented for mechanical thrombectomy. And what was unusual, and this was an unusual trend, again, the mean age was 63, 34% were 55 and younger, 38% uh, didn't have any cerebrovascular risk factors. And the average duration between the COVID diagnosis and stroke was five days. Uh, and 34% of those patients had a stroke as the initial manifestation of COVID. So mean NIH was higher than the usual. And 42% uh, had multiple vessel occlusion, which is more than the usual. 40% required at least three passes, also more than the historical control. 14% uh, rescue stenting, usually it's around 5%, and the duration of the procedure was uh, higher than the usual. Complication rates higher, despite the fact that 94% of those cases had a TIKI 2B or 3, uh, the mortality rate was higher, also uh, 32%, uh, so as you see here. And so uh, again, now for every procedure, we have to gear up, and as I said, it's a new world, it's taking more time, we need to check our uh, check our papers, and then we need to uh, uh, put all this and then uh, be ready. This is my team walking in to do a stroke in, in style. So I'm showing this just to tell you that, you know, the FDA uh, gave an, an uh, emergency use authorization for uh, remdesivir. This was the letter from the FDA that, uh, that did that. So, well, I mean, uh, endovascular robotic may be the answer for distancing and protecting the team. Uh, unfortunately, in the U.S., we can only do carotid stents at this time, as I said. Um, similar to the expedited approval of certain COVID medication, I think maybe it's time or we need an expedited approval for robotic for uh, remote stroke, uh, especially in this uh, uh, pandemic. Um, I think at this point, the, uh, robot, the endovascular robotic system is, is easy to set up. It's user-friendly for diagnostic and carotid stenting uh, so far in our experience. Uh, a lot of advantages uh, of the system, um, physician radiation exposure, uh, reduction of, uh, you know, wearing lead and 
decrease of the orthopedic injuries, more ergonomic for, for the back, more accurate microwire and microcatheter manipulation, and this Vitor showed this uh, uh, better in the intracranial aneurysms that he treated. And uh, we hope that the rapid improvements in technological engineering may potentially enable performing remote stroke interventions, uh, especially uh, in, in those uh, pandemic times. There are a lot of uh, challenges. There's the challenge of the internet, the, the bandwidth and the delay when you're going to do remote stroke intervention. There's a challenge of if you have a complication and it happens remotely, what's going to happen? Uh, again, uh, that's one of them. Uh, so that's why we need to move with caution uh, in that, but this is mainly what we're hoping uh, for. Emma. So at the end, uh, technology is a double-edged sword, so take it with caution. Emma. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. That was very nice. And uh, it was particularly interesting to see the, uh, the your experience in... Dr. Pascal Jadauer uh, has stopped screen share. About the experience of uh, acute stroke from back means. I mean, uh, we haven't seen such data coming from us. So it was very, very interesting to see that. And I'm sure, you yeah. know, everybody will keep that in mind if they see such patients. So if you're okay, guys, so we can start with the question and answers. I mean, uh, I'll read them out for you. And uh, first question was that, uh, let me go up, that how do you cope with only three access systems? Do you place guiding together by hand? I think uh, that has been answered, but uh, Dr. Vitor. So yeah, we... Yeah, the, the guiding catheter has to be placed uh, uh, manually from the micro for the neurosystem. Uh, the, then the micro catheters, micro wires, and devices, it's all placed uh, robotically. Now, I'm going to add for the uh, transradial angiograms. Uh, the SIM2 can be shaped uh, with the robot. That's what I've been doing. And then I, I could hook all the vessels with the robot, but just hooking proximally the vessels. And then after that, it becomes manually when you're going to advance anything above it, or if you want to selectively catheterize internal or external. All right. And um, there's another question, which again, I think has been answered about whether we need spatial microcatheters or the regulars when we do the job. So, Robert, I mean, I'm a qualified. Do all microcatheters work at this point of time? Or yeah, you, you have just to be careful with the length. Yeah, the short microcatheters, 120, 130, it, it will not work because they are too short. Uh, because you have to go with a distox as catheter that is 115. So, uh, every microcatheter that is uh, 150 plus, they will work normally. And uh, everything we tested now, it's fully compatible with the robotic system. All right. And uh, there's another question which was in my mind as well. Can we use two microcatheters? Uh, no, you can operate two microcatheters and you can use two microcatheters, but you have to operate them separately. All right. But that means technically we can. Yeah, you can. And in the future, you imagine you need two robotic systems to use that. I think uh, you it will be able, you can do. But uh, in one robotic arm, you have to manipulate them separately. But if you have two robotic arms, the systems are, are compatible for it. But it's just the length that you have to be careful and cautious All right. about. And uh, there's a question about whether you have any recommendations concerning the choice of micro wire as one-to-one -one talk transfer seems to be even more important here than in the hands of a human operator. So I think what they want to say is all, all wires worked out or only particular wire is giving you that great talk. What's happening? Yeah, no, you, you need to use exchange lengths. And one thing that we learned is that, you know, when we, you put the wire, you remove the introducer, uh, you, you get the micro wire wet. So we, we have to dry it out before putting in the robotic system because then it's it can torque better and it, it has a good grip and then it can rotate uh, way better the devices and uh, we've been testing most of the wires and all all of them work 
Uh, and remember that you have to make the curve that you want because then you, don't, you decrease the exchange and then you, it prevents you to having the proximal part of the catheter that is hydrophilic, also too wet and too slippery for the robot. But otherwise, uh, during six procedures, we had to change the cassette twice because the cassette couldn't manipulate the wire. Uh, it was more a mechanical problem than the compatibility with the wire itself. And uh, if in between, I may ask a question. So what do you want to say is that the machine, the robotic system for neuro intervention cannot be used cardiac for cardiac and vice versa? You need, need that we need different robots for cardiac and neuro? Yeah, you, you know, the, the robot that Pascal used is, is uh, the robot that can do PCA peripheral cardio. The robot that I use is adapted to manipulate micro catheters, micro wires, and has a length uh, that is uh, longer, a working length that is longer. So you have these two robots that, and also all the functions that we have on the neuro, they are different on the cardio ones. So all these rotate and retract uh, device fixation. Some are, are in common, but some are adapted to neural procedures in the neural e equipment. So we can't hope like a country like ours that we buy one, one robot and use by two different departments. So that can't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can, uh, it, it probably this is a question in the future, uh, if you can actually adapt. Uh, the, the cassette can go, I think, in both devices. But the, device, the neural device has a lot of hardware and a lot of software adapted to neural. Probably in the future, this is something that can be easily fixable. You have a machine that will have a cardio or neural function. But I think up to now, uh, I have a neural machine that I cannot do corrupted stent like the way Pascal is doing. And he, his machine doesn't have the same neural functions. What do you think, Pascal? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think, I think the neuro one can be used for cardiac, but not uh, vice versa. Don't you think, uh, Vitor? Can you repeat, uh, Pascal? The neuro one, the one you have, can be used for cardiac because uh, Vipul's uh, question was, can we get just one and use for both? I think oh, the yeah, neuro yeah, one yeah. is very yeah. advanced and can be adapted for cardiac, but not the vice versa. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's true. Right. And, uh, and you have shown cases, but there's a question whether we can deploy flow diverters with this robot with the correct amount of uh, vessel wall opposition. So. Yeah, you can manipulate completely. So the, uh, the, the, all the stents manipulation and even the intracycular device I didn't show here, but uh, you can do as you were doing manually. And if you are experienced, the same experience that you have, you can reproduce that manipulation with the robotic arm. And you can reproduce it in a, in a more controlled way. You know, I, I, uh, I'm doing a series of experiments where I have my fellows doing, I stand manually and I stand with the robot. So some ACOM stands that sometimes it's hard to control the slack and place it precisely. They can do with the robot things that they cannot do manually. So any manipulation, so the, 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 the flow diverters, I, I tested the, the new pipeline Vantage, I tested uh, uh, the Silk Vista, I tested the other stands. You can, the same manipulation you need to improve their position when you are doing manually, you can perfectly do with the robot. Recapture, particularly with the, the, the new devices that we have now, you know, the, the new stands, uh, in which the trackability and the friction on deployment is is is, is uh, lower and it's uh, acceptable. Yeah, because when I read your paper about that first case, and I was surprised that for a first case on robot, you plan to place that stent so precisely with a very little margin of error. And I was wondering when I read that, ki, wow, I mean, that takes something. If I was doing a place from PCA maybe, but now yeah, I know no, after no. your talk, that actually it gave you more confidence. Yeah. yeah, but you saw that I did a number of experiments before I've been working with the system more than a year and uh, almost a year now. So you see that, uh, you know, 
we we knew the limits we we knew the system and actually i'm i'm uh, for some procedures uh i can do it better robotically than the manually for sure very interesting that's very interesting so pascal i mean there's a question about whether we can use a 35 wire and if you can't yeah, use so you cannot as i said earlier yeah you cannot use a, a 35 or 38 wire that's why you cannot do go select internal external uh, for diagnostics the biggest micro wire you can use is an 18 micro wire uh, in it that's it so all right and uh, this again i think it's a repeat like can we control two catheters and micro wire at the same time you know so you know no, with, with the robot, you need to you have to manipulate the wire or the device and the micro yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, you cannot uh, with uh, one the, arm. You cannot have more than, than yeah. that. So there's a question whether you miss the feedback, tactile feedback while navigating or placing devices. You have already talked about in your talk, but to say something further. Yeah. So I I. Yeah, I, I honestly don't don't miss. I, I I'm very comfortable in the console. I think what I missed on feedback, on the feeling, on the haptic feedback, I gain in comfort, and I gain. Uh, I, I, we have the six screens in a TV in front of you, so imagine that you are sitting. You have full control of the procedure. You can see things more. Um, I mean, in a better quality, and you are. Uh, not hanging over the patient to see on a screen pulling. So ergonomically, uh, you gain a lot. And again, if you are used to have a visual, visual sense, as I am training, uh, uh, I have three fellows here every year. I, I've been training fellows for the last 10 years. I've brought a number of different devices. So I'm already used to identify the movements of the wire and the catheter and understand when you have much resistance. So for colleagues that need that feedback, so I have, I've seen some colleagues that need that, so they will need to develop a visual sense before getting up to speed uh, with the robot. But otherwise, uh, uh, I, I don't miss it, but I'm very used to visual sense. But yeah. I think that was a very important part of a visual, you know, sense because I, I realized it myself once I have trained people that by seeing slowly you you adapt to it that just by seeing you know there is more tension, less tension. And that is what I think Vitor is referring to that if you teach people on a regular system. And, and, and now I, I realize, and if you pay attention, when you will be using robot, uh, Vipo and, and Raj, you will see that we use a lot of the visual sense. We don't almost use no uh, haptic feedback. So I know that it's weird to say that, hey, I almost don't need the feeling, but most of the time you don't need it. So, and when you are doing robotics, that you will realize that, oh, today you do already a lot of visual sense and visual feedback than haptic. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's it will be a matter of the colleague. If if it's a proctor already used to visual sense, this is a quick step to robotics. If he's not used to that, he will have to develop it a little bit. But it can be developed with the robot because you will be in a comfortable position. You will have all these tools that help you deploy the device slowly. You know, even steps like catheterizing the aneurysm placing the first coils, placing the last coils. You can, you can manipulate the robot in a more controlled way, the same way that you do manually. So it's a matter of training and, 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 and getting used to that. So, but uh, is, is it something that could be considered in future that they may add a pressure component to the pressure transmission component to the robot? I, I think they are thinking about it, but at, at least, I mean, now I, I have my, my kids, they have a, a console that, you know, we play tennis. And you have with haptic feedback and without. I, I uh, hate the one with haptic feedback because it shakes when you, when the ball, okay. when you hit the ball. And then I all, my <laughs> son is used to that. I am not. So I prefer just the visual feedback. So I'm probably old school, but uh, I, uh, I think, it, it depends what is the feedback that you will need is a shake is a pressure feeling so I, I think this has a lot to be developed at least today i don't see it as a big thing 
if they will say, oh, do you want to develop, uh, uh, what do you want to develop on, on robotics? I would put haptic feedback in the, in the bottom. I think they need, they have more things to develop that will be helpful for the field. And I would say haptic feedback, I would put it in the, in the bottom. What do you think, Pascal? So actually, in their lab, we uh, played a little bit with uh, how they are presetting some pressures, uh, some uh, threshold for pressure where you cannot advance anymore, or uh, they are, you know, trying to see how much pressure can you tolerate. Like if you're gonna have to push so much for a uh, micro wire, is this uh, acceptable or not? To try to develop that. Uh, I, I, uh, Vitor, I think it, it depends. I don't think everyone can work without haptic feedback. And this is something that uh, really you would uh, train for. But uh, uh, in, in, in people that uh, train fellows and residents, yeah, uh, I mean, we, we rely on, on what we see. We rely when we have, you know, the calls that start to... Uh, we see from the from the view that uh, there's some pressure on the calls that you're pushing, uh, but it depends. I think, in my opinion, haptic feedback is is important. It it, it depends on the person. I mean, I just asked the question because uh, we do a lot of ruptured aneurysms, and uh, we do uh, rely a lot on the pressure that we feel uh, feel. So that is why I asked this question for yeah. Yeah, right. You will have to train. <laughs> <laughs> sure, of course. Yeah, you will have to get used to the visual feedback. You know? yeah. But again, I, 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 I do all my ruptures. I, I'm most of the time in the console and I'm telling the guys, push. Okay, so, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I more comfortable. Well, yeah, that yes, one can get it done. So, Pascal, what do you think about timing? You mentioned about time and how the time you're using less. So there's a question there. Can it feature safe time of the procedure? What do you think? The way so, uh, well, it's a learning curve. And uh, Vitor showed that there's not increased time uh, with that. Uh, again, we looked at our first cases. I, I think the most important thing here is to make sure that, because some people had the idea that more fluoro time, more radiation exposure, more contrast, so uh, it, it's actually the same. Now, time of the procedure, as I said, it's a little bit before and after that will add that. This is with the learning curve. It, it won't be uh, an issue. But uh, even with our learning curve, we, we showed, uh, especially in the next paper that's going to come out soon, that no difference in fluoro time, contrast, and everything. Yeah, I, I agree. The, the, the bedside team preparation, that may, may take some time, but uh, yeah, we have the same team doing and working, and uh, the last uh, two procedures uh, uh, was uh, extremely fast. So we, uh, and it, it doesn't take, you know, the time that you are preparing, the, uh, covering the patient with the sterile sheets, the robotic system is prepared, so you have a robotic person that takes care of the arm and someone else is doing the puncture. So you actually uh, lose no time on the preparation. And uh, when the team is, 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 you know, it took us a few procedures. Probably on the third procedure, we were already streamlined. So you don't need to, to take too many steps to get to a faster setup uh, in, into a robotic procedure. Great. And Vito, there's a question. If tomorrow you have an intraop rupture, will you continue with the robotic or will you convert to manual? Yeah, you don't need to. In the past, we had a balloon prepared. So, you know, we wanted this to be successful. I trained a lot. I prepared. I, I had done, uh, uh, there is a question of uh, the value of uh, pre-procedure rehearsal. I think this this for was amazing for us. So we had the Biomodex models that we had uh, done the procedure before, twice, three times, one time, and with the same material that we plan to use on the patient. So this gave us a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, confidence. But I had also a balloon prepared in my first two cases because in case of a rupture, I would take a balloon. But after those two cases, I, I, I don't think we need. If you have a rupture, you have to continue robotically. You can do a turbo, you can change, you can switch, 
And this is what is important because as an operator, you take that decision and you have to tell the bedside team, now my bedside team is confident. And after my second case, we stopped using six French digital access catheters that we had in case we had a balloon to get the balloon quick. And we started placing five French because they are more flexible, they are better. And uh, if I have a rupture with a robot, I would just manage as I manage manually. I continue coiling and uh, my team will prepare a balloon in case uh, I need uh, to use a balloon in case I cannot control the, the bleeding with, uh, with, with the coiling. So I usually continue coiling. This is my, my first reflex when I have a rupture and then I have someone else preparing a balloon. And on that, on that note, you will have someone that will be able to prepare the balloon, the robotic technologist that will keep loading coils and you will be treating the aneurysm. So it doesn't disrupt. We, we also simulated situations in which we would convert to manual in an emergency. So during our rehearsals with the, the biomodics models, we time to time we say, hey, convert to manual emergency. So then we had the technologists disconnecting all the catheters and giving to the bedside operator and also myself to scrub in and get into the, to the robot. So we tested all that. So, uh, and uh, in 20 seconds, we, we can have a manual operator managing the catheter if you need. So I don't, uh, I think this is an important question, but I think as you gain confidence with the robot, you will be able to perform, I mean, to, to develop those strategies to manage uh, the different issues that you may have. Right. And there's a question whether the system can detect air bubbles, you know? It, it doesn't, no. This is your bedside team, and this is something that you have to train. So I, I'm, very, uh, I'm very picky, and I'm very, a little bit uh, sometimes uh, obsessed with bubbles. This was, uh, for me, a big training to trust my bedside team. So they, the, the robotic system use uh, an, a specific type of RHVs. Uh, uh, my team was not used to them. So we had them, I, we, I, had, I have these RHVs in every procedure. So everybody is used to introduce micro catheters and, and not. So yeah, we, we don't have any bubble detection, but this is something that it's being worked on and uh, it's a good question. But now you have to train your bedside team to, man, to place micro catheters and change wires uh, in a good way uh, that uh, you, you will not have bubbles in the system. Yeah. And Pascal, you mentioned about remote stroke intervention particularly in the COVID era. So there's a question whether you think the 5G mobile technology will be the way it will happen. So, uh, I mean, uh, again, I think uh, uh, if we're able to do uh, now, we, we were interested in the system for a potential use of remote uh, stroke intervention before the, uh, even the COVID uh, uh, era. Uh, because in the systems where they have a big uh, network, where they have a, a hub and a spoke model, uh, which we have, uh, this would be an interesting concept to uh, be able to uh, do remote stroke intervention, especially in people that are in geographical areas where it's going to take them more time to come to the hub. Uh, at that time, it may be too late. So this is the potential uh, use that would be really uh, exciting for the robot now even more no one uh, uh, thought about this pandemic what was going to happen and here where you're trying to uh, distance yourself this would be a perfect situation to to be able to do that and again it's still too early we're not at it yet but hopefully soon yeah, but it's it's cool. I'm, I, I'm gonna I, i'm sorry i have to leave i have a case so i want to I thank you for having me no, thanks, Pascal. I mean, I, yeah, I know we've taken a lot of time and thanks a lot. It was very exciting to hear. And uh, we are going through questions slowly because it's such a new technology. I think people are right, they're writing a lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Slowly. And thanks a lot for your time. You know, Thank you. Know, yes. Bye, right. Pascal. It was great Thank to, you. Good to see you. Thank you, Dr. Pascal. Yeah. All right. So, Vipro, oh. I have I, uh, on, on this question of the remote with 5G, 
uh, Siemens and Corindus did a, a, a test on cables and, and different uh, public wireless and, and 5G uh, across North America, across US, and even in times of uh, peak of use, uh, there is not much difference. So I think you don't need too much uh, to do remote. It will not, the problem will not be on the transmission. For sure, 5G will be faster and probably more, more reliable. But uh, if you have, uh, uh, with the public internet today, they demonstrated that the speed of transmission uh, it's, it's faster than what I, our eyes and hand uh, 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 control or, or feedback can capture. So it's perfectly physiological. So uh, uh, we, we are set for remote. As soon as we have the capability and the, the devices, I think we are uh, remote as a matter of set up the systems and uh, more a workflow discussion rather than speed of transmission. Right. And uh, there is a question, um, there's a question that you have mentioned that you use patient specific models to understand the anatomy. And they want to know how do these models add value? And would you suggest similar using these models for future cases? Yeah, every device I will use for the first time or every technique, I like to use patient specific models uh, not only to understand the anatomy, but also to see, uh, develop your different techniques for the case before. So we, we did a number of new devices, new stands, new fold averters recently. And for all of them, as for the robots, I have patient specific models done before because it's also for, for us a reassurance and, and, and also it increase our confidence and you develop techniques for the robot we de we learned a lot on the models that we just translated to the patients instead of learning a new technique already uh, on live so I, I think it's it was a a great added value uh, to the robot system but also any device i will do for the first time i always have a model done before so there is a question whether we have enough ports to perform like gelling technique. Can we do gelling technique here? Uh, no, you have, you, you, one of the catheters will have to be manual and then the other one will have to be robotic. You, you can do, you could do, but you have to place the micro catheter in the aneurysm, then you have to disconnect from the robot and use another catheter for the stent or for the balloon. So uh, you can only use one system with this robotic system, the current version now. Right. And if you do jailing, one of them that has, has to be manual. And uh, there's a question, I think you know the answer, whether any experience with AVM cases or any plans to do so, if I may ask? Uh, no. No, no, I, I haven't done navigation of micro catheters, yes, not in patients, but uh, flow guided and, and also micro catheters for uh, liquid embolic injections. We, we did, we tested, we are doing a full test on, on many different devices and wires. But uh, since we cannot inject the solution robotically, we, we haven't done so any, any AVM case robotically. All right. And uh, there's again a repeat question, whether Synchro 14 is the only wire tested or you have tested otherwise as well? No, I have tested a, a number of different wires. I tested Traxxas. Uh, I, I tested uh, a number of different other wires. We, we will have them all in a publication that will come soon. So I, I just, uh, the journal asked to, to be, uh, yeah, but I, I we will list everything that we tested and we are doing more. So we reach out to all the companies. They all have been very uh, generous and, and very helpful. And they are giving all the devices. We are doing it with just for our field to test and also for to give a feedback to the company. So we, we are doing a number of tests on, on all the different devices 
and it's mainly the length and and the distances that that uh, uh, chains or, or will make a device not compatible otherwise uh, everything is uh, is 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 set it's it's good to to i mean most of the devices are compatible with the robotic system and uh, they have asked, want to know about the cost is in yours of course, i think cost will vary from place to place but in your system is the cost changing because of this no, you have the cassette that is a single use, so this is the only thing you have to buy extra for the procedure. Uh, the, the robotic system, you buy it once, the console and everything is installed, and then per procedure, you buy the cassette. That's the only added cost to the procedure. Yeah. And it's, it's not much. And of course, there's a question about any experience of intracellular device. Uh, experiment, yes. We have done experiments with intrasacular devices, uh, and it all works very well. So, but uh, we we haven't done a case yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, there's a there's there's a comment that there's a haptic technology or kinesthetic communication tech can help us. It has been initiated by NASA, so I guess what they're trying to say, there is some research by NASA about this, but I think you have already answered that how, just by visual, you have become more and more comfortable. Yeah, yeah, but uh, again, uh, this is my, my perception, but I, I, I'm sure the company is working on that. Uh, we, uh, but this is more on their development rather than us on the, on the, on the end of the translation. But uh, again, Having experience with robotic and the experience that I have today, I don't, I don't put a big uh, uh, priority on that. I mean, I, I know that it it seems, it seems that oh, yeah, I may need it, but as soon as you put the robot in your hands after two cases, you will see that this is is not a top priority. Yes, and I think the newer generation will learn that early on, relying more on visual. You know. Uh, when times change, like we have seen our children, you know, their brain works differently than ours. So I guess as the time passes by, <laughs> people will learn it earlier than, you know, you know, and uh, than us. And there's a question that can air vortex rings around gloves of operator give haptic feedback. Um, so I, you understand they're talking about some kind of air vortex gloves. But I don't know when you're using a mechanical system, whether really that can give a feedback. Yeah, I don't know that system. Yeah, no. yes. Yeah. So, and a question about contrast injection via power injectors. Uh, is it separately or there is something in the cassette for the same? No, the, the contrast is connected to the, to the digital access or to the, to the access system. You, it's completely remotely manipulated but is not connected to the robotic system. And there is somebody uh, who is pretty, um, very nice imagination, who has asked a question whether in future we'll use two robots on both sides. <laughs> so can the same system, you can- Yeah, you can, you can have two robots on the side by side, yes. It's, um, yeah, but I think what, what will happen is they will develop a robot that has different modules, one to navigate the access system and the other one to navigate the micro catheters and probably you can have two micro catheters i think we will see a lot of different generations and uh and different configurations i know that the corindus and siemens team they are working on a next generation already so john michael sunger mark toland uh these uh, they they lead a team on on this new uh, product, and they uh, they they are running fast. I think we will we will soon have uh, a lot of uh, good news on, on that front. All right, and um, there's a question which is not really robotics. That what proportion of your stroke procedures uh, you are performing under general anesthesia? So I I don't do uh, we do on the local. Uh, we do on the conscious sedation, but this is a good question. Uh, in our planning, when in the future we will be doing remote, uh, we will be doing remote cases under GA. 
because then uh, you know uh, you you won't have a experienced physician beside the patient you need the patient to be quiet and if the patient is moving too much uh, you saw how the robotic system needs to be in one position and if the patient moves you have to fix it so it, i think it will just delay the procedure when we will be doing remote procedures, at least the beginning, we, we plan to do them in a GA. All right, that's interesting. And uh, I saved okay. this question for last, whether in future you'll think, you know, human will do it better or robots. And here I will add on whether, you know, the robot is gathering this data, is it developing an AI system? You know, and they are, they are, they are. Yeah, no, I think, I think this is all to our benefit. So I have an editorial that hopefully will be out soon about the fear of technology. And this is not now. This is not new. I, 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 I read articles from 100, 150 years ago. Everything new. And, you know, when they turned the last century, uh, people were talking about robots in the 1900s and people already afraid of jobs. And I think uh, the robots, at least what they did with industry, they improved the technology, they improved the precision, they improved the production lines. And yes, you don't have guys uh, turning screws, but you have a guy controlling a robot. And this guy uh, has a better training, a better salary, and, and you can produce more. Another area of, uh, in which the evolution uh, didn't take uh, jobs was aviation. So if you imagine how, how uh, I think we, we don't have a, a, an area that evolved so much like aviation. So you can take off and land a plane completely uh, on autopilot. The pilot is there in case there is a problem to take over. And I see us as being pilots. And in the past, you had two pilots. Now you have big planes, modern, you have four, sometimes eight pilots. And you have more people trained and able to manipulate a plane that is modern, has AI, technology, robotic, and it's completely automated. But you always need someone to take over if there is a, a, an energy a problem, a, a conflict with the system. And as better robotics will be, I think will be to our advantage, make the procedure safer, more precise, with a lot of detections, detection of pressure, detection of bubbles, detection of things that the, the robot is not, can never be tired. So it, uh, it, can, it can control 200 parameters in a procedure and you can control 10. But if there is an energy drop or, or or a drop in the, in the power, then you will have to take over and you have to be able to finish the procedure manually. So I think this is where I see, I do research with AI and robotics and I'm in favor of adopting these technologies because they will all be to, on our favor. But you will always need someone to take over the responsibility to take over the procedure manually in case it's needed and uh, also to, to secure the situation. Same way as in a plane. Imagine a patient will, will be confident if a robot will perform the procedure completely. No. Can, can you take, on a, a, take a flight that is no pilot? No, you can never take a, a, a flight with no pilot. You will not be safe. Imagine you are there uh, to 35,000 feet and there is a, an electric uh, issue and then who, who will take over. So the procedures will all be the same. Even when we will be in many years from now that we'll be just pressing buttons, we will need to be trained in the manual. We will need to, we will need to know to perform the procedures manually. And as best the robotic can be, it will all follow your instructions. So you will need to know the procedure. You will need to deploy. So I, I, I think it will change the training, as you said very well, Vipul. The next generation will have to be used to that, but uh, uh, they, will, they will be early on into this new phase. And I think it's all to our advantage. Yeah, I think there is a fear in many, and that is we, we saw that sad reaction to that fear, manifestation of that fear. 
early on during our uh, session but i i guess things change you know if, even if you don't like it it's going to change and understand and I, move I ahead with it is always better and your answer no. was just perfect the way you compared everything you know yeah now you know I, i saw you know we saw this fear when we started coiling the surgeons were afraid and a lot of anger a lot of things <laughs> now coiling took over we saw the fear and the anger of the neurologists and the the, the 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 neurology community and a lot of our colleagues when we started using stent retrievers my first presentations on stent retrievers back 12 years ago i had a number of people like angry why can you pull a stent and uh, over a carotid this is a crime and you will dissect and now the procedure just changed uh, our our field so i think every we have a fear of what is new which is natural and it's also good it is protective but i think uh, if you want to be in the forefront of our field you will have to understand no better instead of developing an anger or be against otherwise you will you will be in the past yeah and absolutely and ai is going to come into every part of our life in fact what i tell my kids is when you plan your future job plan it in a way how you use ai in that job how you integrate with the ai in that job i mean this is a truth of life it's going to come in, in every aspect and we have to integrate to our use and how it makes our life better rather than fearing it Is, is, yeah, is we, are, we are. I'm, I'm doing a, a, one of my master students. They are developing a tool to measure aneurysms and compare to uh, the follow-up imaging. So, how many of us follow our aneurysms? And how boring is it to measure and define if the aneurysm had a growth or not? And you have a report with one uh, length and another report with another length. And doing it uh, automated, it's so it's so nice. and ai can do it beautifully and you have a report that is consistent and it i'm i'm still doing it but i have a machine that can help me to develop it doesn't mean that i i have to spend half an hour uh, making measurements to tell i can just look the machine does it in a minute and i can just uh, write a report and look for other things because i will not be bored measuring i think we 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 can only benefit of uh, of the technology in our field uh, and uh, i'm i'm convinced uh, i'm always i'm already pushing and as you can see using <laughs> the new yeah, I, i can feel and, a uh, lot of positive energy in you you know i i know you for a while but i can feel today some kind of special undercurrent you know undercurrent of excitement and i can see that you're thoroughly enjoying this period i mean and 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 it's great for all of us to hear about it So there's another question that can we do robotics in LA? I mean, I don't know. We can ask Pascal whether he was doing carotids in LA or not. I mean, what's your opinion? In LA, and what do you mean? Local anesthesia. I think that's what they mean. LA means local anesthesia. Yeah, I mean, if for an aneurysm procedure, yes, you could do. Uh, but you have to. I mean, the patient has to be. Uh, yeah, you can do in local. Okay. If you are used to do aneurysms in local anesthesia, yes, you can. but uh, you 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 have to know that the patient will be listening or unless you sedate all the discussions that your team will have with you outside the room so i don't know if psychologically the patient will be confident but you can always explain all my patients from uh, my robotic procedures they were all very excited to to be part to to have the procedure done and i i educated them before so yes if you are used to do uh, aneurysm procedures on the local yes it is perfectly feasible but you have to know that the communication the workflow is 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 a little different than a regular aneurysm procedure all right and there's another imaginative question that plan for new microcatheters with sensors or tech is it being developed by company yes, it is, it is. wires and all the different detectors yes right. and i guess with the last question that any pre op embolization of vascular brain tumor through this robotic system i guess we know but any views you have about that yeah i haven't uh, done yet but yes you can use you can uh, navigate a microcatheter as far as as you can so this is this would be a a very easy 
uh, use of the robot, but it's perfectly feasible. Yeah. All right. So we have run through our 50 questions <laughs> and, and you have been very patiently answering all of them and <laughs> really overshot our time. We have been close to two hours. Uh, we have been online and I think we had a lot of attendance and not only from India. And I think a lot of them were from outside the country, other parts of the world. And uh, if I may say so, we thoroughly enjoyed your talk. It was exceptionally and um, you know i can i can i i am excited by your excitement i mean the energy i can feel it makes me i'm happy to share my excitement this will be our, <laughs> our future no, it's is positive bright. energy you know you're doing something creating something and i could feel that all the while and it's, it's it's very nice to see that and inspires us to do whatever we can do in our uh, world you know and where we are there and maybe youngsters like Gaur Raj Nivas, who is my colleague, is a brilliant person. I mean, they are the people actually, he will, they are the right stage to listen to this and take it forward. So uh, and I think now we can close this session. And my, again, I want to thank you for all the time and the effort and the terrific talk. Thoroughly enjoyed, one of the best talks I've heard. And uh, we'll be putting this talk up on the our YouTube channel as well. It is live stream on the YouTube and we'll put it on YouTube channel because already there were questions whether we'll be sharing this. So let us see. We'll do that as well. And I want to thank you, everybody, and to Mr. Ujmal Bhatia, who helps us in organizing this meeting. Thank you, Vitor. All the best. All the thank best. you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.